Hello again, and welcome back to Channel 514, where we are, as of right this minute, continuing with our series Exploring Ancient Literature. And I'd like to begin with a shout out and a thank you to everyone who uh, either recently or a ways back sent positive feedback about this series in particular and asked when new videos would be coming. So please uh, forgive my having delayed so long. And today, let's really try to deliver the goods and move the series forward. So we had left off with uh, Pindar and Bacchylides, two of the famous early Greek lyric poets. And before that, we had discussed Homer and Hesiod, the two most celebrated uh, epic poets. So uh, we're still in the territory of early Greek literature, so prior to the classical age proper. And today we'll discuss some of these other early poets. And depending on how long that takes, I may go into some of the early philosophers and into Aesop or I may put that off to another video. But um, I'll point out first that these Greek poets to the ancient Greeks don't just represent the content of their work, but they also stand as these iconic figures that each calls to mind a special ethos and a particular uh, way of interpreting life and responding to life. And this is, um, this is more widely the case with great artists and authors, but it's not always the case. So say, for example, someone quotes from Edgar Allan Poe, well, even though his work is pretty diverse, you probably will first think about uh, graveyards and ravens and that, that kind of thing, right? Um, but if somebody quotes Shakespeare, well, you might think of a lot of things, but it, it depends on what play they're quoting or what character said that line or something like that. Um, so it's, uh, so the case with these early Greek poets is more like that of Poe, is what I'm saying. So we'll uh, begin with Archilochus. And uh, these poets uh, fall into two categories, lyric and elegiac poets. And uh, let's not dwell on that distinction too much um, because it has a lot to do with uh, technical uh, aspects of poetry like meter. But to some extent, it has to do with the content as well. Um, so elegiac poetry tends to have a more heavy, serious um, tone and subject matter. So uh, when you use that word today, elegiac, um, as in like an elegy, you know, you're, you're usually um, going to be referring to, uh, you know, a statement about someone who has died or about uh, some, some heavy, serious thing that has happened, right? So um, that's enough about that. But we'll begin, as I said, or as I may have said, with uh, the poet Archilochus, a lyric poet who's supposed to have lived in the uh, 7th century BC. And what he represents to the Greeks um, is a contrast to the more high-minded, noble, aristocratic, heroic ideals of, say, a Homer or a Pindar. So um, where Pindar would uh, talk about excellence and high striving, Archilochus would talk about trying to, uh, you know, get mine, you know, I got to get mine. Or he would um, talk about, uh, you know, ways of getting out of trouble or of uh, getting back at somebody who hurt him or, or irritated him in some way. So um, so that's Archilochus. And we'll go into a few uh, fragments of his uh, work that have survived. So here's one that talks about how the vicissitudes of life um, 
are uh, really um, something that dominates our lives and that you know is kind of more important than an individual's uh, uh, lofty ideals, right? So this is number five in the book that I'm using, which is uh, a 1993 anthology edited by the classicist Bernard Knox. It's the Norton Book of Classical Literature. And I've had it forever, and uh, by now it may be kind of dated, and Norton may have uh, something better out now because they do publish a lot of really nice anthologies. But this is fragment number five, and it goes, a tribute all to the gods. They pick a man up, stretched on the black loam, and set him on his two feet firm, and then again, shake solid men until they fall backward into the worst of luck, wandering hungry, wild of mind. So, so you know, you have uh, the gods uh, w can pick you up, you know, when you're down, or you may be a really solid person, but they'll make you hungry and wild, right? So, um, so that's a, an example of, of uh, Archilochus and his, his attitude. And now we'll go to uh, number 10, which is a really famous one uh, of his about throwing away his shield to get away from a battle. And it goes, some barbarian is waving my shield since I was obliged to leave that perfectly good piece of equipment behind under a bush. But I got away, so what does it matter? Let the shield go. I can buy another one equally good. So, of course, you know, um, Homer's uh, heroes wouldn't have said that. Maybe Thersites would have said that. But, um, you know, someone, uh, a character uh, with uh, loftier ideals, of course, you know, a heroic character wouldn't say that. Oh, I threw away my shield, but who cares? Because I'll just buy another one and I, I got away. But... Um, Archilochus, you know, is saying um, that he doesn't care that he did something that's seen as disgraceful and wrong um, because he did what he had to do, you know. Um, and there's another fragment that I won't go to um, because uh, it, it's very explicit, but uh, he talks about what he did uh, with a, in private, you know, with a, a woman, a girl, to whom he was betrothed, and um, whose father had eventually broken off the betrothal. So he's angry with this, with this girl and her family, um, and so he talks about uh, what they did in private uh, very explicitly. And the story goes that the, the family was uh, so... Um, well, that uh, so much shame uh, was cast upon the family by this poem, which became very popular and was uh, uh, heard all around, you know. So, uh, so the girl and her father ended up uh, committing suicide, is how the story goes. So um, that's another famous one by Archilochus that uh, goes to show what he represents to the Greek imagination. So next, I'll go to uh, Tertius, who's uh, sort of the, the semi-legendary poet laureate of Sparta, who represents the uh, Spartan ideals. And he's also supposed to have lived in the 7th century BC, at the time when Sparta is uh, fighting a war with uh, Messenia, with the Messenians, who are a neighboring people. And the uh, historians, of course, um, didn't exist at this time, so, you know, there's no contemporary historian to tell us about this war, but, but the uh, tradition is that the Spartans defeat the Messenians and they reduce uh, at least some of them to a kind of serfdom, and those people are then the ancestors of the Helots, who are uh, sort of the uh, serfs of Spartan society, whose agricultural labor, um, whose uh, surplus, you know, produced um, the uh, wherewithal for the Spartan uh, warrior elite. So, 
Sortaios is, you know, the great Spartan poet, um, which is, you know, significant because uh, that city-state and that culture, of course, doesn't seem to have produced a lot of uh, literature. But I'll just read an excerpt from a poem that uh, here, I don't know how common this, uh, how often this title is, is uh, attached to it, but our editor calls it the Spartan Creed. And I'll read, um, not the whole thing, but about uh, the second half of it or so. So he's talking about, um, well, I'll skip around a little, let's do that. So we'll, we'll start in the middle, and he's talking about um, being a good warrior, you know, so he says, Here is courage, mankind's finest possession. Here is the noblest prize that a young man can endeavor to win, and it is a good thing his city and all the people share with him. When a man plants his feet and stands in the foremost spears relentlessly, all thought of foul flight completely forgotten, and has well trained his heart to be steadfast and to endure, and with words encourages the man who is stationed beside him. So that doesn't sound much like Archilochus at all, really. Um, this is a very different uh, image that we're, uh, that we're seeing um, form before us here. Um, he goes on, his tomb, so what if this person is killed, his tomb is pointed to with pride, and so are his children and his children's children, and afterward all the race that is his. His shining glory is never forgotten, his name is remembered, and he becomes an immortal, though he lies under the ground, when one who was a brave man has been killed by the furious war god, standing his ground and fighting for his children and land. Um, and he then goes on to talk about uh, what happens if this person is not killed, well, he um, enjoys honor and he's uh, a respected citizen. So, so that's uh, Tertius, and I wanted to go on from there to Theognis, and he um, is supposed to have lived in the 6th century BC, and he uh, is a resident of Megara, which is a city-state near Athens. And the funny thing about Megara, as a side note, there's the, our author's name. So uh, the funny thing about Megara is that in Athenian literature, it's the neighbor, you know, and it's not really a serious rival to Athens in any way. Um, and there isn't really... Uh, well, there isn't necessarily such great animosity between Athens and Megara as there might be at different times between, say, Athens and Thebes, or Athens and Sparta, of course. But, uh, but the Athenian authors always ridicule Megara. They always kind of um, make jokes about it. But um, Theognis is from there, and he's an aristocrat, and... Um, he's been exiled, so there's been a shake-up in that, in that city-state, and um, some of the aristocrats, including our poet, have been exiled. And so he's very bitter about the experience of life in exile, um, what a sad life that is, and it was considered to be um, a very serious thing in, in the ancient world. And... Um, so he's very bitter about that, and he's bitter about um, social relations between classes. So he really doesn't like uh, the fact that uppity, you know, non-aristocratic people have um, have gained this upper hand over him and his kind, and how he's been um, he's uh, come out on the losing side. And then he also, uh, so yeah, he has a grim view of life in general, and he's also um, always addressing his poems to uh, to one of his, you know, to his young uh, his young friend, you know, so his his young uh, um, his young man, you know. So um, I won't. Uh, 
I don't think we need to really like discuss very much that uh, aspect of uh, ancient Greek culture for it to be, you know, clear enough what I'm uh, talking about. But uh, that's always the person to whom Theognis' poems are addressed is his his young man, you know. So, um, and uh, when you read his poems, you know, you tend to think of him as uh, as this, you know, bitter old man who is, you know, always like drinking or you know he's in his cups and he's uh, uh, he's complaining and unhappy about um, you know how uh, the world has been cruel to him and um, how uh, everything was better in the old days and you know now he's been exiled and this is so bad you know but I'll only uh, I'll only read one fragment of his uh, but there are a lot. There are a lot that uh, survive. And to illustrate that, I'll go back to the uh, edition of Hesiod that we used uh, to discuss the uh, Theogony and the words, works and days. And um, this volume is, of course, Hesiod and Theogony, so the, this volume includes both these poets. And Theognis' uh, poems in this volume go on for... Uh, about 60 pages or so, so, so there, there's plenty of it, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll read two fragments. But this is uh, the most famous one, and uh, sometimes a, a title uh, or an incipit, you know, uh, a first few words, you know, uh, is attached to it like the best thing or best of all. Here it begins with the words best of all things. So uh, it's just a few lines, and this is number four in this volume. Best of all things is never to be born, never to know the light of sharp sun. But being born, then, best to pass quickly as one can through the gates of hell and there lie under the massive shield of earth. So, so you know... Uh, if someone asked him what's what's the highest good, what's the best thing there is, he'll say, "Well, just never to be born." You know, uh, the best thing is to not exist. And uh, if you can't have that, then it's best to die right after you're born um, and rot in the ground. You know, that's uh, that's the attitude that this author represents. But I said we'd read one more fragment, so. Uh, Let's see. Ah, so here's one uh, about class, you know, nobility and, and uh, the commons, etc. So this is number six, and it goes, In breeding donkeys, rams, or horses, we seek out the thoroughbred to get a good strain, my Kornos. Kornos is his young man. Yet now the noblest man will marry the lowest daughter of a base family, if only she brings in money, and a lady will share her bed with a foul rich man, preferring gold to pedigree. Money is all good breed, and, uh, money is all good breed with bad, and race is lost to riches. Don't wonder our city's blood is polluted when noble men will couple with upstarts. So, you know, he doesn't like that, uh, the nobles and uh, the non-nobles are mixing and mingling, and uh, he doesn't like that money, uh, you know, probably accumulated through trade and business, you know, is now um, a greater source of power and influence than it used to be, and it's coming to uh, be more powerful than uh, aristocratic lineage and and family uh, kinship relations. So, um, so Theognis doesn't like being poor. Um, he doesn't like being alive. You know, he doesn't like being in exile, and he doesn't like uh, the way the world around him is changing. And that's kind of um, that's not all that you find in his work, but that's really um, that's the attitude about life that. Um, he symbolizes. So let's uh, let's go to one more, and that's Solon, S O L O N, who is uh, the great Athenian lawgiver and uh, political reformer. And um, 
So he sort of um, represents the idea of a man who uh, spends a lot of time in exile, like Theognis, and travels around the world and sees many things and speaks to many people, but um, uh, and who, whose work is sort of um, is great and important. Uh, he's done great and important things that are not appreciated. And uh, so he sort of um, has a shadow over him. And the story, um, the story attached to him is that he uh, lived in the 6th sixth, sixth century BC and that he was uh, a political figure in Athens and he, um, he instituted some political reforms to try and alleviate the tension and the hostility between uh, the social classes, so between the rich and poor, the aristocrats and the commons, and he felt that uh, the people would not, uh, that neither side would be satisfied with the compromise that he had, uh, that he had um, legislated, and so he went into self-imposed exile but first made the uh, state, the city-state of Athens, promise that it would not revisit his political reforms un unless he himself were in the city and were, you know, consulted. And so to make sure that they won't have a chance to do that, he gets out of town and he goes into self-imposed exile and wanders the earth for some time. And uh, so we have a good amount of poetry um, from him, and he also will sometimes appear as a character in literature, and we'll see this in particular, and you may have heard of this already, uh, you're quite likely to have heard of this already in the uh, work in the histories of Herodotus. So um, it's in Herodotus in particular that the, uh, that the character of Solon that I described earlier um, is found, and also, of course, in Plato, where he tells the story of Atlantis, but, um, so that's Solon, and now we'll read a couple uh, fragments of his, and then I think, uh, and then I, I think I'll cut this off after that, and we'll save the other stuff for uh, the next video. But okay, here we go. Here's a good fragment, and we'll just leave it at that. It goes, where, and this is number one in this volume, sorry. It goes, where did I fail? When did I give up goals for which I gathered my torn people together? When the judgment of time descends on me, call on my prime witness, Black Earth, supreme excellent mother of the Olympian gods, whose expanse was once pocked with mortgage stones, which I dug out to free a soil in bondage. Into our home, Athens, founded by the gods, I brought back many sold unlawfully as slaves, and throngs of debtors harried into exile, drifting about so long in foreign lands they could no longer use our Attic tongue. Here at home, men who wore the shameful brand of slavery and suffered the hideous moods of brutal masters, all these I freed, fusing justice and power into an iron weapon. I forced through every measure I had pledged. I wrote the laws for good and bad alike, and gave an upright posture to our courts. Had someone else controlled the whip of power, a bungler, a man of greed, he would not have held the people in. Had I agreed to do what satisfied opponents, or else what their enemies planned in turn for them, our dear city would be widowed of her men. But I put myself on guard at every side, spinning like a wolf among a pack of dogs. So that's uh, a good example of the, the character of Solon that comes through in his work, that um, he's really trying to save his beloved city-state, and, you know, the people are like these angry dogs, and, you know, neither side is going to be happy with what he's trying to do. Um, so... Uh, 
so apparently he didn't get a very good, or he didn't feel that he had gotten a very good response in his uh, lifetime. But of course, to posterity, he's this sage, you know, um, this uh, sagacious, wise um, figure who, um, well, uh, you know, who wanders the earth and sees many things. But, but anyway, that's, uh, that's a little, um, that's a little bit of a, uh, a quick, um, tour of some of these other early Greek lyric and elegiac poets. And, um, I would have liked to have made that shorter, but, um, that should do for, that should do for that. But, um, my, my point that I, of course there are many more, you know, there, there are, are really quite a few more and some other, uh, books where you can find these, um, are in particular the Loeb series, you know, and these can be, um, even used copies of these, unfortunately, are, are pretty pricey often, but they, they include the Greek and the English, you know, they're bilingual editions, but, but uh, the Greek ones are always green and the Latin ones are always red, but this one, Greek elegiac poetry, um, you can see it's kind of chewed up looking because I, a long time ago, I was uh, on a trip and I had this in my backpack and I got like soaking wet in the rain and so, you know, it's all, it was really nice and new at the time and now it's all messed up, but. But um, there's that, and there's several of these uh, of lyric poetry as well. And uh, so that stuff is pretty available. There's also this one here. I've had this for a long time, Greek Lyric Poetry, a new translation by this guy, Sherrod Santos. But, uh, um, and this deals with, this includes poets from, you know, across the, the span of Greek history, but, um, it's pretty good. I think uh, the translation is, is kind of a little more poetic than I would like it to be at times. Um, I usually prefer something more literal, but, but it's not bad. But um, there's that, and, and I think that, sh that should just about do it. So when we come back, uh, I think we'll talk about Aesop. I think that's a good place to go to next. So thanks, uh, thanks again very much, and I hope that this wasn't too. I hope this was okay and not a big disappointment after um, a long hiatus. So um, thanks very much once again, and I will of course be seeing you soon.